This is part four of this first week of lecture. Um, we've been talking about an introduction to the class and ancient Greek theater. Last time I uh, probably put you all to sleep by talking a bit about Aristotle and the poetics and basically how we began to tell stories the way that we are all used to doing. And then I promised, threatened, uh, promised that I would walk you through the plot of one of the classic Greek tragedies. In this case, uh, the play is Oedipus Tyrannus by the Greek playwright Sophocles. Um, I have a lot of uh, thoughts and experience with this play because, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the summer of 2006, I was hired as a teaching assistant for the University of Georgia system um, of colleges to go to Greece for a summer and spend six weeks teaching theater, but also really why they hired me to go was so that I could play Oedipus in this play because the performance was supposed to happen at the end of the semester, so the theater class, all the grades, like you had to be in the show if you participated in the theater class to get an A. So yeah, they wanted a ringer, so they hired me to play Oedipus. So as I said, going to Greece for a summer uh, for six weeks uh, and getting paid for it and performing theater it didn't suck to be me that summer. So let's talk about that and I'll use the opportunity to walk you through uh, the plot of Oedipus Tyrannus and show you how it fits with what Aristotle was talking about and it, it has all examples of the classic Greek theater stuff, catharsis, the six elements and all that. Um, so this play, I, the performance I was in, was in Thessaloniki, Greece, which is in the northern part of Greece. It is Greece's second biggest city. Basically, in Greece, it's a bunch of countryside, uh, and everybody's scattered. Most people live in the two big cities, Athens, which has about five million people in it, and then Thessaloniki, which has about two and a half million. Uh, in Athens, about 90% of the population of Athens speaks functional English because it's a tourist site. So, yeah. If you talk in English in Athens, people are going to basically understand you. You may have to, um, you know, do charades and gestures and point at stuff to make yourself clear. But, yeah, basically most people are going to understand what you're saying. Whereas on the other hand, at Thessaloniki, uh, like 95% of that population, 2.5 million people, none of them speak English at all. So when we performed the play, we were performing it in English, obviously. Uh, I do not speak Greek. It is all Greek to me, in fact. That's a Shakespeare joke. None of you thought that was funny. Anyway, so, yeah, we performed it in Thessaloniki uh, one miserably hot night, because that's what Greece was, miserably hot. Like, being from Georgia, I thought I understood heat. Like, Greece was so miserably humid and hot that in the six weeks that I was there, it rained twice for, like, 15 minutes, and it never, ever got below, like, 90 to 95. So the rain was just enough to drive the humidity up even more and make it even more miserable. Um, but still, you know, I was in Greece, so I can't really complain. Um, if you're following along with slides, um, I'm starting on slide number 48. That's a broad overview of the theater at Epidaurus, the oldest surviving theater in the world. Uh, if you flip over to the next slide, slide 49, you get to see uh, a look at me um, the day that the uh, study abroad group was there. There were like 80 students in the entire study abroad thing and they all went on these trips uh the theater class had um, say 18 or so people in it total anyway somebody told them the whole uh if you're standing at the center you can be heard all the way up at the top so of course people ran up to the top to see if that's true and then i did a monologue from oedipus uh that day when we were there um so just for perspective again i am five six five seven so you know I am on the short end of average these days. Uh, I would have been tall for back then. So on the picture on the left on slide 49, uh, that little speck up front, that's me, right? Uh, and then on the right-hand side, that is somebody taking a picture of me from the front row of seats. I mean, it's stone bench, but yeah, the front stone benches, the front row. So yeah, that gives you perspective. It also helps you to understand why Actors in tragedies would have to wear the giant wooden tiki head mask with a big frowny face or smiley face on them and the Lady Gaga three foot tall wooden platform shoes just to give them a sense of height so that everybody all the way up at the back could see them. Again, this theater seated 15,000 people. Okay, 
And by the way, Epidaurus is still used all the time for performances. People perform there all the time. It was being set up uh, the day I was there for a performance later on that night. So, all right, let's talk about Oedipus Tyrannus. Um, Tyrannus in Greek means king. Uh, sometimes you'll hear this play called Oedipus uh, Rex, Latin for king, right? Tyrannosaurus Rex. Um, Oedipus Tyrannus or Oedipus Rex, but what it means is Oedipus the king. Uh, it was written by the Greek playwright Sophocles, and it was first performed in the year 429 BCE as a part of the, you know, yearly, week-long, drunken, Mardi Gras-style orgy of theater and other things that happened every year and was part of the central part of Greek culture and religious worship, where everybody switches over to worshiping Dionysus for a week and just watches a ton of theater and gets real turnt and does some perhaps real, real nasty things over that week. Uh, Dionysus would approve. Anyway, Oedipus is the uh, is part of a trilogy of plays because they like sequels just as much as we do, concerning what happens to this same noble family over a period of years. Um, Oedipus, the king, is chronologically first, but it was actually written second, so it is the phantom menace, if you will, to the play Antigone by Sophocles. Um, so it happens, it was written second, but it happens before the events of uh, Antigone, sorry, the cat tried to jump into frame. Again, forgive cameos from my cat. He's a drama queen. So, yeah. Um, the year that Oedipus was performed in the playwriting competition, I find this funny, it did not win. It is this great classic tragedy of theater and is revered and, you know, priceless uh, to us culturally. But, yeah, it won second place. Did not win because I guess that other play was just way better. Anyway, so yeah, one came in second place the year it was performed. Okay, so here's the thing. I've got to go into some background for it for you to totally get the context because Sophocles, writing in 429, he would have expected his audiences to know certain things walking into the play in the same way that if I were writing a play today, if I used the name Abraham Lincoln with an American audience, I just expect you to know who that is and don't have to explain who that is. Right? So Sophocles was working under the same sort of principle. He put things in that he expected his audience to know, and they would have known. But his audience, you know, that's like 2,500 years ago, so yeah, we're not going to be as up on the cultural context and references as Sophocles' audience would be. So I'll give you um, a bit of the backstory to help you understand fully what's going on. All right, so uh, we're flipping over to slide. Uh, 51, if you're following along. Uh, the pictures, by the way, are all images from the performance uh, that night. We were sort of uh, supported, co-opted. We were part of, considered part of the National Theater of Greece for this performance. Um, there were about, I'll say, 800 people there. Uh, you know, about 700 of which did not speak a word of English, but I guess, you know, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth translates to whatever language. All right, so here's the basics. Um, the city of Thebes, which, okay, Thebes uh, eventually will become Athens, okay? The city of Thebes, the city-state of Thebes, is beset by a plague, we are told at the beginning of the play. Uh, so all these people dying of a plague, um, not knowing what to do, the suffering citizens of the city assemble before the palace and beg the help of their king, this guy named Oedipus. Oedipus isn't that old of a king, though. I mean, he is relatively young. I mean, we, generally speaking, when we say king, we think, you know, old, shaggy, gray-bearded guy. No, Oedipus is, we'll say, maybe 35, 40, maybe. Um, but he's young for a king, but he is also super famous throughout the entire world. And he is king because when he wasn't uh, as old as he is now, like when Oedipus was, say, 20, he saved Thebes in the past, and so they made him king for doing that for them. Um, here's what happened to get Oedipus to this point. Uh, Oedipus didn't know his family. He was wandering the earth like Cain in Kung Fu. And starts way apart from this. Thebes, at the time, talking years and years before, when Oedipus is like 20, he's now, you know, it's like 15 or so years after that. So the old king of Thebes was this creepy old guy named uh, Laius. Laius was a dirty old man. He, like, super nasty, super dirty, super old guy. 
And uh, as many dirty old men do, uh, he took a young, hot trophy wife to be his queen. Her name's Jocasta. Um, Laius leaves the city and then dies under mysterious circumstances while he's gone. And so Thebes doesn't have a king anymore. And then their real problems start because this giant monster lands outside the city gates of Thebes. It's called the Sphinx, right? That thing that sits next to the pyramids, right? Body of a lion, head of a woman, yeah. So the Sphinx lands outside the city gates, and anybody that tries to leave the city or go into the city, the Sphinx confronts this person with a riddle. It's called the Riddle of the Sphinx, right? And here, let me put it out to you and see if you can solve it. Uh, most of you probably will have maybe even heard this before, uh, just because, yeah, Oedipus's impact is pretty significant on us culturally. Um, here's the riddle of the Sphinx. What animal goes on four legs in the morning, two in the afternoon, and three in the evening? Anybody know? I don't know why I said that like you could answer me right now. The answer is man, right? This is not a Bruce Willis was dead the whole time, plot twist, oh my god. No, the answer is man, right? In the morning of our life, when we're babies, we crawl on all fours. In the afternoon of our life, when we grow up, we walk on two legs. And then in the uh, evening of our life, our old age, two legs, cane, walking with a cane, third leg. Yeah, so not a stumper, but apparently nobody in the ancient world had ever heard this before or was bright because... The Sphinx, every time somebody tried to go in the city or leave the city, the Sphinx asked them this riddle, and nobody got it right for like a year and a half. So, here's the punishment. If you get the riddle wrong, the Sphinx eats you. So yeah, for a year and a half, anybody trying to get in the city or leave the city gets eaten by the Sphinx. And so that creates real problems for Thebes eventually, because while there are a lot of people that live in Thebes, and there's plenty of stores in the city at first... After about a year and a half, if you can't get food in, and it's not like they didn't have farms and stuff, they had plenty of food outside the city that they just couldn't get into the city. So yeah, after about a year and a half, people are starving, people are turning on each other, eating their, uh, eating themselves, eating their animals. Yeah, the city's screwed. And then, 20-year-old uh, homeless Oedipus comes wandering by the city of Thebes, walking the earth like Cain in Kung Fu, and he encounters the Sphinx, and the Sphinx asks him the riddle. And much to the Sphinx's surprise, Oedipus answers the riddle and gets it right. And the Sphinx is so caught off guard by somebody actually getting it right, it doesn't even realize that Oedipus is drawing his sword. And then, boom, Oedipus cuts the damn thing's head off. So, yay, Oedipus saves the city. The uh, starving citizens of Thebes emerge sort of awestruck at this 20-year-old who managed to save them all. And they were like, okay, young guy, you're great. You just saved everybody in the city. You're awesome. Hey, we don't have a king right now. You just saved us. You should totally be our king. How's that sound? And Oedipus is like, well, okay. I mean, I was homeless and didn't have any friends or family, and I was just wandering the earth like Kingdom Kung Fu. Sure, sure, I'll be king. Why not? But not everybody's going to be on board with this, so the elders of the city come up with this great plan to cement Oedipus' tie to the throne. Because, yeah, somebody might be like, he's like a 20-year-old. Come on, he can't be our king. So here's what they do. Uh, creepy old king, Laius, who died, right, his hot young trophy wife uh, was way younger than him when, you know, he married her. She was like 18, smoking hot. Yeah, he was creepy, dirty old man. He's dead. She's still the queen, but she's not ruling because the world was horrible to women, as it has been forever, sadly. Um, but hey... Her husband's dead. Why don't you, Oedipus, marry his old queen, and then that will make you the new king, and nobody can complain because you have a direct tie to the throne now. I mean, Oedipus is cool with doing this because Jocasta is a little bit older than him, um, but not much older. I mean, he's 20, she's like, say, 35, and she's, you know, she's 35, but she's much like Stacy's mom, she's totally got it going on. So she's, uh, you know, a MILF in the truest form of the word. And Oedipus is like, yeah, okay, I'll marry her, why not? And that makes him king. Uh, at first, the marriage is a purely political marriage. It's just to tie him to the throne so nobody can complain. But pretty quickly, Oedipus and Jocasta find that they're, they love each other very much. They're very attracted to one another. They have great passion for each other. And yeah, despite their difference in years... Um, Oedipus and Jocasta fall deeply in love with each other, and they end up having four kids together. Two boys and two girls. Okay, 
All of that is the backstory, right? Sophocles would expect you to know this going in. I know that we are not as likely to, so that's why I'm walking you through it. So yeah, the uh, dying citizens from this plague, a symbol, oh man, just occurred to me. Everybody dying from a plague. Funny how we're talking about that these days. Hmm. Anyway, uh, they didn't wear their masks, so they're all dying in front of the palace steps, and they beg Oedipus to help. So, moving on to slide 52, if you are following along. Now, Oedipus is pretty convinced that he alone is the only buddy who can save everybody, his people, because, yeah, he's done it in the past, so he's fairly confident in his abilities. Oedipus sends out messengers across the land to find out the cause of this plague, and the messengers come back and they tell him that the plague is the direct result of the murder of the last king, creepy old guy Laius, who got killed, and that the plague will continue so long as Laius' murder goes unpunished. So Oedipus grabs, uh, gathers all the people up together and makes a proclamation to the entire citizens of Thebes and basically offers to spare the life of the murderer, whoever they may be, if they only come forward and confess their crime and accept banishment. Now, I mean, let me, ah, no, too much light. Um, here's the thing. This offer is immensely generous. Like, no ruler back then in their right mind would have, like, been like, oh, yeah, all you have to do is admit it and then leave. That's all. We're not going to kill you. We're not going to punish you. Just admit your, what you did and then get out. So, yeah, it is an immensely generous offer that Oedipus makes. And then nobody steps forward to take responsibility. And that, um, that triggers Oedipus uh, to employ one of his tragic flaws, which is his temper. Oedipus has made an immensely generous offer that anybody in the right mind should accept, but nobody steps forward, and that kind of pisses him off. So, Oedipus, once he gave them the chance and nobody steps forward, Oedipus launches into a really nasty curse on whoever the murderer is. So, he's furious that his generosity is being ignored. He lays a heavy curse on the murderer that whenever you're found out, and you will be found out. Whenever you're found out, you were going to suffer for the rest of your long, long life. You're going to live a long time, and everybody's going to know what you did, and you will have no friends, no family, no one will love you or care for you. People will spit on the ground rather than, you know, look at you. You will be infamous all over the world. People will know who you are, and you will suffer, and you will live a long time and suffer through it. Be hated by everybody. So, yeah, whenever the murderers found out, that's what's going to happen to them. Uh, next slide. You see where this is headed, right? I mean, even if you've never read this before or seen it, uh, we've seen enough stories in the last couple thousand years that you probably at least get the sense of, you know, where this plot is moving towards. Anyway, Oedipus now summons this blind fortune teller named Tiresias uh, in front of him, and Oedipus demands that Tiresias, who's a fortune teller, look into the mystic's time and tell me who the murderer is. And Tiresias is like, Okay, yeah, I know who it is, but I'm not going to tell you. and You don't want to ask me, and I don't want to say, and it would just be bad all the way around. So I'm just going to dip, right? And Oedipus is like, oh, no, 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 no. You're going to tell me. And here's the thing about Oedipus, <clears throat> right? Like, this is going to make him sound worse than he is. Like, he threatens Tiresias with imprisonment and death and torture and all that kind of stuff. He's like, no, you're going to tell me. You're going to tell me sooner or later. You're going to tell me right now, or I'm going to lock you up in the deepest, darkest dungeon I can find, and I'm going to torture you and mutilate you and break you in every conceivable way and make you feel every conceivable pain for as long as I possibly can, and I will keep you alive and make you suffer until you talk. So you might as well tell me now, because you're going to tell me eventually. And Tiresias is like, fine, jerk, it's you. And Oedipus is like, no, no, no. Yeah, forget it. That's not possible. Right? Here's the thing about Oedipus. Oedipus is a good guy. He isn't a tyrant. He isn't a bad guy. Oedipus is doing everything he's doing is in order to save people's lives. He cares. He legitimately cares about the people that he rules over and doesn't want them all to die of this plague. So, yeah, he does threaten terrible things. And, you know, he means them. I mean, you get the sense that he really would do that to her if she doesn't talk. Um... But he's doing it, he would argue, in aid of saving people's lives. Like, you know, the ticking time bomb argument. If you had somebody in custody and they knew where a time bomb was that was going to go off, would you do everything you could to get that information from them, even if it means torturing them? And you're going to, you know, in a second, see maybe why that's not the best idea. Anyway, Tiresias says, uh, yeah, it's you. And Oedipus says, no, 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 that's not even possible. But... 
he does recount this weird thing that happened to him when he was a lot younger. We're on slide 54 now. Anyway, as a young man, you know, at age 20, when he was walking the earth like Kane and Kung Fu before he encountered the Sphinx, he got into this physical brawl at a crossroads with this rude old traveler and his caravan. So here's what happens. Oedipus, by himself, arrives at this crossroads, and then right afterwards, creepy old guy in a big wagon and a bunch of his, like, uh, you know, entourage posse arrive at the other side of the crossroads. Now, politeness of custom dictates that Oedipus gets to cross first since he got there first. But what happens when Oedipus tries to cross first is that the creepy old jerk guy starts, you know, name-calling him and shouting at him, and then, you know, the uh, his entourage and posse start yelling things at Oedipus, and then they, you know, throw rocks at him. And then Oedipus responds the way that any sane and rational person would to this. He murders all of them with his bare hands. Temper and pride and, yeah, temper control, definitely. Weakness of Oedipus character. Bad impulse control. So yeah, Oedipus murders all of the old guy and his posse, not even knowing who they are, because it's a creepy old guy. Uh, turns out, that sounds pretty similar to what happened to King Laius when he died. Road Rage, you know, 1.0. But yeah, by far, the worst is yet to come. Skipping over to the next slide. So, turns out, way back when, when creepy old King Laius was on the throne... He and his hot young trophy wife, Jocasta, heard this prophecy. And the prophecy was that their son would grow up, their son who was a baby, would grow up and kill dad, kill Laius. So they did what responsible parents would do in that circumstance. They'd give their infant child to a servant to go out and lose in the wilderness, to kill it, right? Prophecy cannot come to pass if the baby never grows up. Baby can't grow up to kill dad if baby never grows up. So the servant you know, has this infant child in his hands. It's like, well, I can't just kill a helpless baby. So, yeah, he refuses to kill the child outright, but instead, he comes up with this great scheme, he thinks. He, instead of just killing the baby, he leaves the baby out on a hillside, out in the middle of BFE, nowhere. Yeah. And, you know, the baby's not likely to survive that, because, you know, it's a baby, like two years old, at most. And so, yeah, wildlife's gonna show up, eat it, or it's just gonna starve to death. It's a baby, can't even walk. But the servant doesn't want to take chances, because if the baby survives, oh man, that servant's going to get real killed. So, the servant, here's what he does. Uh, he takes a knife, and he takes the baby, and then he cuts a hole through the baby's ankle. And then takes a cord, a leather cord, and sticks it through the hole, which is just nasty, and ties it around the wound, and basically takes the other end of that cord and stakes it into the ground, because now, baby can't possibly survive. Because, you know, even if the baby manages to start trying to crawl away, it's attached to a cord that's stuck in the hillside. That baby's gonna die, absolutely positively. There's no need to even go back and check on this plan to make sure it happens, because how could that baby possibly survive? The serpent thinks. Uh, weirdly, now, hearing this story from Jocasta, his wife, adult Oedipus reveals that he grew up as an orphan and he never knew his parents or family at all. And also, weirdly, Oedipus has had this scar on his ankle his whole life that's just been there his whole life that he never knew how he got. Oedipus, by the way, in Greek means club foot because, yeah, Oedipus walks with a limp from the scar. Uh, which means, I imagine for you that the penny has dropped, if you didn't already know, uh, next slide, Revelation, you, Because turns out, Oedipus was, in fact, the murderer of the old king, though he had no idea who that old guy was at the time. The old king was, indeed, King Laius, Oedipus's father, who Oedipus was prophesied to kill. Which also means that the queen of King Laius, who then became Oedipus's queen and wife after he solved the riddle of the Sphinx, is not only his queen and wife, but also his own mother. Okay, yeah, Return of the Jedi has nothing on this crap. Like, that is some Game of Thrones stuff right there, right? Oh, yeah, by the way, that also makes the four children he had with his wife, who he loves very much, uh, not only his sons and daughters, but also his brothers and sisters. Again, that's some Game of Thrones nastiness right there. So, uh, Jocasta, realizing everything that's gone down, suddenly freaks out and goes running off stage, and Oedipus runs off after her. And then this thing happens, a messenger comes running on from offstage, right? Here's the thing about the ancient Greeks. They refused to show acts of violence on stage, right? They had no problem 
talking about violence, you know, describing these really violent things that happen, but it would always be just off stage. So, yeah, a messenger would run on and be like, oh my god, you'll never believe what's happening right over there, right behind that wall where you can't see, but oh my god, there's so much blood and running and screaming and monkeys and ah, right? So that's what happens now. Jocasta runs off, Oedipus follows her, and then this messenger runs on and explains what's going on that we can't see inside the palace. Next slide. Uh, so yeah, all that's left is basically weeping, wailing, and a lot, lot, lot of blood, uh, at least in our version. So we're told that Jocasta has hanged herself in her chambers. Oedipus, upon discovery, breaks down the door, finds her dead body hanging there, and goes mad with grief and disgust. So he grabs these two golden brooches that she uses to pin her hair back, and then basically proceeds to stab his own eyes out, rather than look at the world that he has corrupted with his very existence. So yeah, that's what the messenger says. Now, Oedipus returns back to the stage, and he is blinded, and the full weight of his own earlier curse now falls on him. He's the murderer, after all. Um, back in the day, what they would do is, like, you know, they would take the giant wooden tiki head mask and, like, you know, uh, cover the eyes with, like, a cloth or something. You can see we went a little bit more visceral with it. Um, so, yeah, not only is he not king anymore, uh, everybody has decided that he's going to lose his home, his fortune, He's thrown out of the city. He's going to wander as a blind beggar for the rest of his life with no friends, no home. One of his daughters, his youngest daughter, Ismini, is going to stay with him and guide him. But everybody else, the two other boys, the uh, other daughter, Antigone, they all abandon him. And Oedipus is kicked to the door. And yeah, his earlier curse, which was pretty severe, it now comes true. He is going to be hated for the rest of his long, long life, and everybody's going to know who he is, and he will suffer. So Oedipus takes a while to curse fate, the gods, and himself, but eventually he accepts punishment from the gods for his hubris, his pride, right? I'm alone, the only one who could save everybody. I have to do these things. I have to be unpleasant. I have to show my temper. I have to be angry. I have to threatened to hurt people. But no, you didn't, right? You could have found another way, but no, Oedipus didn't. And here's the thing that's tricky for us to understand in a modern context. Again, it's like I said, Oedipus isn't a bad guy. He is a really good guy. Everything he does is done with the intention of saving people's lives. Like, he really cares and doesn't want people to die. But that doesn't matter, right? Because in Greek tragedy, it isn't about an outside force bringing you down. It is about your own flaws. Right? Oedipus didn't try to find another way. He went just with his temper and his pride and his hubris. And so that is ultimately what brings his downfall. Right? It's not an outside force. It's Oedipus himself that causes his downfall. So yeah, it's not that you're supposed to hate Oedipus. You're supposed to really pity him. You are supposed to pity what happens to him because he is a good guy trying to do good things. And look what happened. The road to hell, we are told, is paved with good intentions. Certainly it is for Oedipus. So, yeah, the Greeks' morality isn't our morality, right? Oedipus is a good guy. The guy who replaces Oedipus at the end of the play is a tyrant. Like, he will lead to uh, lots of people dying. He will be brutal and cruel and horrible in a way that Oedipus was not. Oedipus' oldest daughter, Antigone, will die at this tyrant's hands. It's not about that Oedipus is a bad guy being punished. No, Oedipus is a really good guy, but he's being punished for his flaws for letting himself get out of control, for not trying to find another way. So yeah, that is Tote's Greek Theater right there. Anyway, uh, slide 58. So Sophocles has two other plays that chronicle the events that happens to what's left of Oedipus's family, because they like sequels just as much as we do. Uh, Antigone is about Oedipus's daughter, uh, who dies in prison in a cave because she refuses to allow one of her brother's dead bodies to be dishonored and desecrated by the guy who takes over from Oedipus. Um, the two sons, they kill each other in a war to take the throne. Uh, Antigone buries one of them, and then she gets locked up in a cave, and then she kills herself. Uh, and then finally, the third play, Oedipus at Colonus, you flash forward and you have the older wandering Oedipus, uh, who is now, you know, an old beggar who has wandered the earth with his daughter, and only his daughter, to look after him for, you know, decades. Um, and then finally, at the end of that play, 
because Oedipus is virtuous, he is ultimately forgiven by the Greek gods and is allowed to ascend from Earth to live in happiness on Mount Olympus. I don't know if they give him new, you know, Mount Olympus eyes or he has to live in paradise blind, but whatevs. Uh, the picture, by the way, on this page is the single greatest picture ever taken in your life and my life and everybody's life. Oh my God, I love that picture. Uh, by the way, if you're wondering, here's the recipe for fake blood uh, that works great. It is chocolate syrup, red food coloring, and a little bit of peanut butter to give it the right chunky gore texture. And that's it, that's all it is. And yeah, when you make it, it's gonna look dark in the bowl, uh, but when you put it on skin and clothes, it really pops and it looks really, really real. And it washes out of clothes very easily uh, for your Halloween costume purposes. And I will say also, it tastes way better if you get it in your mouth than the fake blood that you can buy from like, you know, makeup houses and stuff. Uh, Plus, if you have plenty of blood left over, it goes well on ice cream because, you know, it's chocolate syrup and peanut butter. All right, so um, there you go. Much of what we think of when it comes to theater and storytelling and performance emerges out of the theater of the ancient Greeks. I mean, weird as it is, we get a lot of stuff from them. Uh, Greece uh, treasured their theater. That playwriting competition went on for hundreds of years, and they saved copies of all of those plays. Uh, and then when Greece kind of goes the way of the dinosaurs and Rome takes over, Rome, a lot of its theater traditions are rooted in Greek theater because they revered the Greeks. And so the Romans kept all of these Greek plays, thousands of them, and preserved them in the Library of Alexandria. And then... Uh, sometime during the Crusades, uh, Christian Crusaders set fire to the library and burned it to the ground, and that meant that we lost thousands and thousands of all of those Greek and Roman plays. They had thousands in the library. There are 37 plays that survived that fire. We have 37 complete Greek plays from back then, both comedies and tragedies. That's it. They saved thousands. We have 37. So each one of those 37 is kind of priceless beyond measure in terms of its cultural significance. Um, had any of you ever heard Oedipus, the king, before? I mean, did you uh, know that the plot twist? I'm curious to know. I guess, you know, send me a, a message and let me know if you had heard it before or you figured out where it was going. Um, if you take it psychology, by the way, uh, Sigmund Freud, a uh, dirty old perv that he was, called uh, the impulse that bo young boys have to replace their father and, you know, be in love with their mother, the Oedipus complex. Um, you know, named after this. There's a female version called the Electra Complex, also from Greek theater. Anyway, yeah, um, there is a thing about uh, a term deus ex machina that we will go over next time. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about plays and playwriting and how to do all of that stuff. But I thought it worthwhile to finish up with the Greeks today uh, so that we never, ever have to talk about them ever again. That's a lie. They're going to come up. But we're never going to necessarily focus on them ever again. But from them, we get dramatic theory, the way that we understand how stories work and how to perform stories and tell them. We get story structure. We get the first actor, Thespis, that moder the modern name for people who study the profession of actors uh, is a called a thespian in the honor of Thespis. So yeah, we get a lot. Weird as it is, it's at the heart of everything that uh, we all like and have these days. All right, I hope you have a great weekend. Uh, we will pick back up next week with plays and playwriting and how to do all that, and I'll turn you all into playwrights whether you sort of want to be or not. You're welcome. All right, have a good weekend. Bye.